Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day two of the 10th Biennial Education and Science Forum. My name is Natasha White, and I represent NOAA's Office of Education, Educational Partnership Program with Minority Serving Institutions. We're looking forward to another exciting day of presentations. If you were um, not here yesterday, you definitely missed a treat. We heard from a number of the Cooperative Science Center students, as well as NOAA leadership, and we heard from some of the EPPMSI alumnus. So today we look forward to more of the same, beginning with our first session. Session one today <clears throat> is, an, is a roundtable discussion about NOAA's strategies for science. So we're gonna discuss artificial intelligence, cloud computing, uncrewed systems, omics, and ecological forecasting. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of session one. The moderator is um, for the next session is a friend, a colleague, and an alumnus of the EPP MSI Graduate Sciences Program. Dr. Danae Carlis sir, currently serves as the Deputy Director of NOAA's Global Systems Laboratory, where he is responsible okay. for leading the yeah. scientific mm -hmm. and information technology efforts of the no laboratory. Worries. Along with the laboratory director, he leads a staff of nearly 200 scientists, engineers, oh, wow. and administrators. During his 18-year tenure at NOAA, Dr. Carlis has successfully navigated the ranks and has advanced from his early career as a meteorologist to his current position. Dr. Carlis is an advocate for the EPP MSI program and for diversity, equity, and inclusion within NOAA and his community. He attended the Mecca, Howard University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in um, chemistry, bachelor of science degree in chemistry, and master's and doctoral degrees in atmospheric sciences. It is an honor to present to you, Dr. Danae Carlis. Thank you so much, Dr. White, for that wonderful introduction. I cannot uh, say how happy I am to be part of the 20 year, uh, I'll, I'll, let's call it a family reunion of uh, all of the graduates of EPP MSI programs, whether you're an undergrad scholar, whether you're a graduate scientist uh, scholar, you know, we are one big family and I'm extremely excited to be here to celebrate uh, at the 10th biennial EPP MSI Education and Science Forum hosted by the fantastic um, Florida A&M University CCME. Uh, yesterday was uh, Florida A&M Day. Today we're going to switch it up and, and talk a little bit about some of the other universities that are part of this, this family. So I'm excited and I'm ready to get started. So in order to get started, I want to, of course, welcome everyone that's out there uh, to the strategies for NOAA science. We're gonna be talking about artificial intelligence, cloud computing, uncrewed systems, eco forecasting and omics. And if you don't know what that all means, we're gonna let you know very, very soon. So we are excited to be here and we have some fantastic panelists that are going to uh, share their background, share their history, share their stories with you today. And so we cannot um, do this, put on an event like this without a lot of support. So number one, let me first start off by thanking Florida A&M University CCME for putting this event together. It truly is an honor. Uh, this is definitely 18 plus years for me being a part of this particular community, this family, and I can't wait to continue to see uh, how we continue to move forward in the future. So let's start with the introduction of the panelists for today. And I'm going to read their bios in the order that they will be presented to you today. Uh, we're gonna have some time for questions. Each panelist will get uh, 10 minutes to provide a, an overview of their careers as well as the, the NOAA strategy uh, that they are focused on. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. So first off, we have Dr. Jimmy Sims, who was selected to enter employment within NOAA as a member of the EPP MSI Graduate Sciences Program during her tenure at Howard University. She currently serves as a physical scientist and senior science advisor for artificial intelligence in the NOAA National Weather Service Office of Science and Technology Integration. In this pioneering role, Dr. Sims is strategically establishing and overseeing the National Weather Service AI portfolio 
to provide guidance on AI research, development, and applications. So let's welcome Dr. Sims. All right, we next have Dr. Gary Wick, is a, who is a research physicist within the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, and is currently serving as the acting director of the NOAA Oceanic and Atmospheric Research Uncrewed Systems Research Transition Office. Dr. Wick has been involved in <clears throat> the oversight of multiple UAS-based projects and served as the lead scientist on the NOAA Sensing Hazards with Operational Unmanned Technology, SHOUT mission, to evaluate the utility of the Global Hawk aircraft to improve forecasts of tropical cyclones. Let's welcome Dr. Gary Wick. All right, next we have Dr. Jeanette Davis, who currently serves as the policy advisor to the Deputy Undersecretary of Operations at NOAA. You heard from Ben yesterday, Ben Friedman, where she helps with the operational programs and helps to coordinate the implementation of molecular tools or omics throughout NOAA science missions. A marine microbiologist by training, Dr. Davis is an alumnus of the EPP MSI Living Marine Resources Cooperative Science Center and author of the number one feature children's science book on Amazon entitled, Science is Everywhere. Science is for everyone. Let's welcome Dr. Jeanette Davis. And the last speaker you'll hear from today is a good friend of mine, Dr. Lonnie Gonzalez. He is an environmental scientist with NOAA's National Ocean Service, where he serves as the manager for NOAA's highly interdisciplinary eco forecasting science portfolio. Dr. Gonzalez is a proud champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion in ocean and atmospheric sciences. He is an EPP alum who performed his doctoral stud studies at the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore under the Living Marine Resources Cooperative Science Centers, LMRCSC. Let's welcome Dr. Gonzalez. All right, now I want to share my screen here. And let's see. Tasha, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. We're I seeing your see. notes slides though. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good. You're good. Okay. I want to move this over here and we should be ready to go. All right. Again, welcome to the strategies for NOAA science, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, uncrewed systems, and omics. This is an outline of today's session. First, of course, we started off with introductions. Uh, next, we'll talk about some of NOAA's research priorities, and I'll present that information to you. And then we'll go into the NOAA science and technology strategies, s and strategies. And those are cloud computing, artificial intelligence, uncrewed systems, omics, and eco forecasting. All right, let me first start by giving you my one, one slide, uh, five pictures in 120 seconds, introduction of myself. I am, of course, Danae Carlos. I am originally from Tulsa. Uh, and if you don't know anything about Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, you should definitely know about uh, the massacre that occurred in 1921 uh, on the streets of Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. Uh, where there was a strong, thriving Black business community uh, that was basically ripped apart um, and uh, destroyed uh, by folks in the Oklahoma and Tulsa community. Um, Tulsa is my home. Tulsa is still home to many of my family members. Most of my family still lives in Tulsa. Uh, and so I represent Tulsa and Oklahoma in general wherever I go. And the next picture on the bottom left is uh, a school uh, that I attended in high school. It's called Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, one of the top 100 schools in the nation. I realized that education was the way for me uh, while attending 
Booker T. Washington High School. Uh, it's a high academic rigor school, uh, and it was absolutely important to who I am and why I actually uh, went on to attend Howard University uh, for my bachelor's, master's, and of course, PhD eventually. Um, and then the next picture is at the top right. Uh, that picture is of me and my classmates uh, from the graduate EPP graduate sciences program. This picture was taken back in 2002, uh, August 2002. And this is really the day when I joined NOAA. The guy in the middle uh, is the was the NOAA administrator at the time, uh, Vice Admiral Conrad Lautenbacher. He swore us in that day. And if you look at all of these people that are part of this picture, I think it's six of us standing around uh, uh, Admiral Lautenbacher. All of those people still work for NOAA. So NOAA has a way of getting into who you are as an individual, uh, allowing you to pursue your passions uh, and allowing you to really make a difference in the world. And all of these people are still friends of mine today. So networking was talked about a lot yesterday. Uh, the people that you are in, in your courses with today, you will still see them you know, 15, 20, 30, plus years later. Uh, the slide on the bottom right, um, I'm really big on mentoring. I love uh, young people. I'm the president of the Seed of a Nation uh, ministry in uh, Washington, DC, although I currently live in uh, Colorado. Um, and so I work with boys that come from single parent, single parent homes, whether it be single father, single mother homes. Uh, and we have over 30 uh, young men of color that we mentor on a regular monthly basis. And then, of course, I cannot go without uh, sharing a picture of my wife, Lydia, my daughter, Dia, who is about to graduate from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she'll be graduating with her degree in um, African American Studies uh, this, this coming May. Uh, so I wanted to share uh, that information. And I would, met my wife at Howard University, of course, uh, uh, back in, uh, what, 1995. So we've been together for a very long time. All right, so next slide. So let's talk a little bit about priorities. Of course, you all know who uh, really runs the White House, correct? Uh, you know, that bison lady uh, named Kamala Harris. Uh, you know, she's running things right now. And, and so what are their priorities? Every organization, every administration comes in with their priorities. Uh, and I think it was mentioned to you yesterday, tackling the climate crisis is one of their priorities in terms of uh, the Biden-Harris administration, improving forecasts, whether it be severe weather forecasts, precip forecasts, or water forecasts is another priority. Uh, climate adaptation and resilience is extremely important to our economy, uh, extremely important uh, in terms of environmental justice uh, to our communities. Uh, so climate adaptation and resilience is extremely important as we continue to move forward. And then fire weather is a new one that really is becoming, as it pertains to climate, a crisis within our, uh, within our country. Uh, I, I currently live out in Boulder, Colorado, out west. So um, uh, understanding the fire weather crisis is a priority for us here, and I'm glad that it's a part of this current administration's priorities. So, and of course, making sure that we protect the public health and the environment. We all know we've all been impacted by the coronavirus COVID uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, hopefully we're moving in a, in a better direction. I, I definitely can see it, but public health and the environment is extremely important to this current administration. And then advancing racial equity and, and support for underserved communities. Wow amazing that that is part of in it of the the white house's administrative priorities I, I don't know when that's been the case uh before but uh if you take a look across our organizations you know you look at you know our universities we're having different conversations today than what we had you know just just a year ago um, we're, we're seeking out uh, funding for different programs and setting up different programs, doing equity reviews of our programs and our organizations to figure out how we can better serve uh, our communities. We're doing it at NOAA, and I'm hoping that you are doing it 
uh, within your organizations. Now, let's talk a little bit about NOAA and our research priorities. You should, every, every you know, department with or agency within the federal government, you should see some level of overlap between the, uh, the administrative, the White House's priorities and our own uh, you know, NOAA research priorities. So you see climate, cl climate adaptation, you see climate services, you see improving forecasts, you see the fire weather as a priority. You see supporting underserved communities. Also, you see the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and UXS Research Program as a NOAA research priorities. There, there is complete alignment every time that there is a, a shift or a change in the administrative priorities. The agencies must shift and change with those administrative priorities. And then that means also you should shift as a research scientist, depending on what it is that you do, uh, to make sure that you are in alignment with the organizational and the overall um, our nation's uh, priorities with respect to research. Now we have these NOAA science and technology strategies. We have six of them. There, there are six focus areas on for NOAA to guide our transformative advancements in quality and timeliness of NOAA's products and services across our mission areas. Our strategies are in the field of citizen science, data, artificial intelligence, uncrewed systems. We also have one in the use of advanced methods to analyze materials such as DNA, RNA, or proteins called omics. And then the final one that I'm going to talk a little bit about is um, cloud is our cloud strategy. And our cloud strategy is really focused on providing accessible and scalable secure information to the to the public through a suite of cloud computing technology products and services in order to fill, fulfill our mission. So we want to advance the state and methods of the way that we do our science and be able to do it in a more integrated fashion as we continue to move forward. And if you take a look at our cloud strategy, what we want to do is enable innovation through adoption of cloud-based services, but we also want to do it in a smart way. Not everything can be, can be migrated to a cloud computing environment. And then we want to ensure that though that that environment is secure and that there's broad access across NOAA, but also within uh, the university community, private sector, we want to be able to work more effectively uh, with our partners out in the field. And then in terms of providing effective governance for cloud, sh cloud shared services, that is something that we have to do internally within the agency so that you know when you are using cloud computing, you're basically paying Amazon or Microsoft or uh, Google to use their computing services. So we have to have effective governance and be able to watch what those costs are. And then we want to empower a cloud ready, ready workforce. And I think that's where you as students come in. You know, we, we are looking for engineers and scientists that have experience with their, their, their science being able to use the cloud environment for their research. And so that, that, that means that we need you to, to work on some of our organizational missions and priorities. And we want, because that really helps you to set your direction and it helps you to do your selection with respect to the actual strategies that you align with. We also want to make sure that you understand our strategies. That's why we're having this conversation today and how, that, how these strategies align with your particular research goals. Now, science, innovation, and opportunity can all be seen in these strategies. So figure out which one of these strategies aligns with your goals and with your mission in life, and then apply that to the work that you're doing. And align, you know, whether you're applying for um, uh, new internships, be able to mention some of these strategies and how they align and help uh, you to achieve your goals. So next, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Jamise Sims.
Thank you, Danae. Um, that was an excellent overview of our NOAA science and technology strategies. I will talk a little bit more about the NOAA artificial intelligence um, strategy and work that we're doing within NOAA across all of our mission areas. It is extremely um, exciting to be here today to talk with you all. Next slide, please. So my 15120, um, I'm a proud graduate of both Jackson State University and Howard University. Both of these uh, schools have historical programs related to meteorology and atmospheric sciences. And so it's always a pleasure to talk about the opportunities that getting an education um, from these programs with the support of the Educational Partnership Program um, has allowed me to have wonderful experiences within my career. Um, I received the undergraduate scholarship program while I was at Jackson State, and I was also a graduate scientist student um, while I was at Howard University, which allowed me to continue to work at NOAA throughout the time that I was getting my PhD. Some of the work that I've done in NOAA, um, you can see at the center, the picture um, that looks like it has some of the, the grids and the numerical um, numbers that represents the artificial intelligence. When I was um, in the undergraduate scholarship program, my first research opportunity used a genetic algorithm to determine the correct parameterization for a model that we were using to find the Gulf Stream. And so um, this just shows that a lot of the work that you may be doing in undergrad in these internships can come back to you full circle um, and provide you with even greater opportunities uh, down the line. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, one of the uh, projects that I've worked on in my 16 years being with NOAA that um, I was really happy to be able to contribute to was the goals are uh, series. I was formerly the GOES R algorithm engineer and satellite product manager. And with that, I actually stepped outside of my comfort zone and learned a lot about satellites um, and the weather satellites that we uh, create and actually maintain within NOAA. And so um, I was given the opportunity to represent NOAA and talk about the great work that our scientists and engineers are doing in order to improve our weather forecast. Additionally, numerical weather prediction has also been a major part um, of my career throughout the years. And so I started um, with numerical weather prediction and my PhD at Howard um, was using the hurricane weather re research forecasting system. Um, and so even now I'm getting back into more numerical weather prediction um, as I get back into the National Weather Service. So as Danae mentioned earlier in my bio, um, I am currently the Senior Science Advisor for Artificial Intelligence. And prior to me uh, rejoining the Weather Service within probably the last six months, um, I worked very closely with NOAA leadership in order to lead the development of the S&T strategies, um, particularly artificial intelligence, and also to understand what how many projects and what our projects are really doing um, in these different areas. Next slide, please. So when we talk about NOAA, one thing that I like to point out is that NOAA provides forecast and guidance from everything from the sea out to the sun. And so it takes a lot of atmospheric and environmental data in order for us to do our job and meet our mission goals. Um, we use satellites, buoys, radar, uncrewed systems, as we mentioned, um, robotics and things of that nature. And so in collecting all of this environmental data, the question becomes, how can we process the data um, most efficiently and how can we use it across the agency throughout um, our line and staff offices as needed. And so artificial intelligence has certainly been a tool that we've actually used now for over 25 years. Even though AI is certainly rapidly evolving right now, the agency has actually been using it um, for a long time. The difference is, is that we are now seeing the growth because of the amount of data that we have and the compute capacity 
um, that we now have as technology continues to expand. Cloud computing, um, the big data initiatives um, that, that Danae just mentioned, you know, these are, are things that are being put in place for us to better utilize um, our data. And with AI, we can process it much more efficiently. Next slide. When we talk about artificial intelligence, we pretty much use it as an umbrella statement. A lot of times you will hear AI as well as machine learning and deep learning. And machine learning and deep learning are subsets of artificial intelligence. And so within NOAA, we use AI for data quality control, even for fishery surveys and model parameterization, as I mentioned earlier for automated weather warnings, uh, ocean robotics, as well as environmental mapping and hazard detection. And so um, even though my focus now is more so on using AI to improve weather forecast, again, it's something that we see um, being used much more now um, across the agency. Next slide. Our AI strategy was released back in uh, February of 2020. And then in January of 21, we released our strategic plan for artificial intelligence. Um, in each of the strategies, there are five goals. Um, for AI, we talk about the organizational process, how we will advance AI research, accelerate the research to applications, strengthen partnerships, and also improve our AI proficiency within the workforce. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that will really thrust um, the, the AI work forward is the approved NOAA Center for Artificial Intelligence. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and how it would impact you um, in some later slides. Next slide, please. Across NOAA, we see AI being used for satellite and meteorology, underwater, aerial and aerial imagery, uh, electronic monitoring, active and passive acoustics. And then there are some other environmental areas um, that we're using AI for as well. Next slide. I know that we're under time constraints, so I'll be moving through this very rapidly, but I'm always open for questions. Um, afterwards. So as I mentioned earlier, we've been using machine learning um, and AI for numerical weather and climate uh, modeling systems. And so this is just a timeline that shows, um, you know, the use of artificial intelligence uh, through data assimilation, um, understanding the errors and things of that nature within our numerical weather prediction systems. Next slide, please. Within the National Weather Service, one of the main um, ways that we are using AI is to improve our models, be it for physical parameterization or bias correction, um, particularly within the global forecasting system and the ensemble forecasting system. You know, these are the models that are used uh, by our weather forecasters um, in the local offices to be able to predict and provide warnings to the public. Um, what we want, of course, is for people to take action um, when there is severe weather being uh, predicted, but also we want to make sure that we are not over predicting and providing forecast and warnings where it's not needed. Um, we don't want to you know, cause anyone to panic and, and make moves that they don't need to. And so it's extremely important that we get it right. Um, artificial intelligence has also allowed us to understand, you know, the biases within the models where we may be receiving some false um, information so that we can reduce those errors and make sure um, that we're providing accurate information. Next slide. Within our fisheries office, our National Marine uh, Fishery Service, one of the ways that we have been using AI is to analyze imagery, um, be it from satellite, aerial, surface, or underwater imagery in order to do stock assessments and counting of fish. And so we've been uh, seeing benefits of 20% savings when it comes to compute time. And also we see the synergy here of the cloud, using the cloud computing and data, um, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a lot of synergy across um, the, the different s and strategies. Um, again, I'm going to move through these pretty quickly, but you can see the details on the slides. Next slide, Tasha. 
Again, in fisheries, um, we're using AI and machine learning to um, support different investigations. The example here is when we have ships that will actually turn off their automated identification systems. And with the use of our satellites um, and the different information that we collect from our ships, we're able to understand if there are illegal fishing um, going on. So that's another use of AI and machine learning. Next slide. Within NESDIS, one of the examples is using machine learning in order to predict geomagnetic storms that um, are extremely important for understanding the health or the danger of satellites um, as well as astronauts um, when they are out in space. And so uh, what we've done here is actually put out an X prize competition um, in order to receive um, in order to partner with different uh, companies in order to uh, improve upon this uh, predictive system for geomagnetic storms. Next slide. In the National Ocean Service, there's a collaboration um, between NOS as well as the National Weather Service in order to better predict rip currents. A lot of times, you know, we may have, um, again, a large amount of imagery um, that we need to analyze and AI and machine learning um, is being used to do that as well. And so rip currents can be um, deadly and we want to make sure that we are providing the forecast for those. Next slide. Getting back to understanding our climate, um, one of the examples from OAR is oceans research, monitoring of ocean state for improved climate predictability and predictions. Um, this is another example of research using AI and machine learning framework um, in order to uh, make the, the outflow of information you know, much more um, efficient. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, how we are looking to upskill the current workforce and also provide training opportunities for the future workforce. Um, going back to the National Center for uh, for artificial intelligence. We look to that center um, in the near future to provide training opportunities, not only for the current workforce within NOAA, but also in order to provide more opportunities for our uh, private industry and academic um, institutions that we partner with. Um, we always like to make sure that we uh, you know, communicate the message that we are not looking to replace any positions. What we're looking to do is actually enhance positions. And so we want to make sure that where AI can be uh, used and where it should be used, that we have the expertise across the agency or that we're leveraging the expertise um, within our partnerships in order to get that done. Um, it's extremely important that we have a diverse group um, in order to provide the expertise that is needed. You know, we certainly need um, more, more uh, people of color. We need more Blacks and Hispanics, especially, um, in order to provide the different uh, perspectives that are needed in order to properly use AI. Um, and so we certainly look to continue to partner with the Office of Education and the Educational Partnership Program. Um, we actually have some upcoming discussions to talk a little bit more about how we can um, partner with some of the, the, the additional partners that we have. So somewhat partnering with our partners. Um, so <laughs> I look forward to those discussions. Next slide, please. Um, as I was just talking about with the partnerships, partnership serves as uh, force multipliers in order for us to achieve our goals. Um, we have cooperative institutes within NOAA, the cooperative science centers, as well as we're partnering with the National Science Foundation AI Institute for research on trustworthy AI in weather, climate, and coastal oceanography. And so, um, Within that NSF, uh, within that NSF partnership, you know, this is again where we talk about making sure um, that we are providing that trustworthy um, AI across our mission areas. And so, I really look forward to what that partnership will bring. Um, within Google and Microsoft, 
We also partner with these two companies um, across the agency in order to uh, leverage expertise and also provide um, you know, better data assimilation techniques and things like that. So again, looking forward to the result of these partnerships. Next slide. All right, and so that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions that we can't get to today, my email address is here, jamise.sims at noaa.gov. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Wick. All right, well, thank you very much, Danae, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Let me uh, bring up my slides here. I'm very, very, oops, very happy to be able to take part in this in this session today. This is the first time that I've been involved in one of these, and it's it's really exciting for me to to do that. So, all right, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes, yes, we can see. All right, very good. So I don't have a dedicated 15120 slide, but I'll start out by, by saying just a couple of words about myself. I'm uh, originally from Denver, Colorado, went through the public school system there and, uh, you know, then went on to the, the University of Colorado in, in Boulder, where I still sit today. And from there, my path to where I am now is a little bit different from maybe what I envisioned when I went off to school. And I like to say that I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life and, until I went to graduate school. But my degrees are all in aerospace engineering. And I originally thought, oh, I wanted to work with aircraft design and, and things in that direction. But senior year, I took a class in remote sensing and found that I really liked that. And then lo and behold, I ended up in graduate school and so started working with uh, satellite-based observations of the oceans originally, and then that moved into the atmosphere, and then uh, got into airborne measurements, and then, then finally had the chance to, to fall into to some of this work with, with uncrewed aircraft. And so I really feel that I've gone full circle in a way to, to get back to, uh, to, to some of these uh, aircraft-based th based things. And so you take advantage of every educational opportunity you get because you maybe don't know where you're going to end up down the line. So, so I'm pleased to talk today about the, the uncrewed system strategy and, and applications in NOAA. And so where I really should start is, is talking about what, what are uncrewed systems. And you know, by definition, the way we refer to them is, is vehicles and the associated elements like the sensors and everything else that execute their missions without a human presence on board. Board. And so these vehicles can be aircraft, like shown in the top. They can be sea vessels, as shown in the bottom with the sail drone. And so the X in UXS really represents that spectrum. They can be UAS for aircraft, UMS for maritime systems, but we're really talking about all of those. And so they can range in size from the very small, like you might get at a, a Best Buy multi rotor system up to something like the Global Hawk shown here, which is as large as a regular aircraft. And then their operations can range from full pilot control to where the only difference is, is that the pilot is on the ground someplace to a case where they're fully operating on their own, entirely autonomous. And you know, the, the interest in these is based on the concept of they can you know, increase safety, they can allow you to fly in areas that are too dangerous to fly otherwise, and then you know, oftentimes they do offer the potential for reduced cost as well. And so the overarching goal in, in NOAA looking into uncrewed systems, there are a couple of points here. And you know, when we first started out in this activity, the, the idea was really to explore how these uncrewed systems can complement our existing observing systems. And you know, Jimmy stated the comment about how our role is from the, the sun to the bottom of the sea. And so this graphic on the, on the right really highlights that, that, that our observing systems, we range from, from satellites in the air, we've got ships that go out on the water surface, we've got traditional crewed aircraft shown here. And so then the uncrewed systems allow us to complement those observations, filling the gaps in those observing systems with higher resolution, broader sampling. And so they really allow us to expand our mission. And then the, the next main goal of the strategy is to move towards the point where these are used much more widely and in a regular basis throughout all of the, of the NOAA missions in, in NOAA. 
And so here I just wanted to say that we've already got a lot of activities going on with uncrewed aircraft and they really do span a large range of the NOAA missions. So here I just show a couple of these examples. Looking at the top, we see some of these multi-rotors that we fly out and there's a lot of work in terms of marine monitoring. So this is you know, the detail that you can get from these aircraft flying over uh, schools of whales shown here. And then, you know, moving to the center, this is an image of seals, sea lions on a beach. And that was collected actually by this person over here in the right in the aircraft there. And so it, it really gives us the capability to fly into the Aleutian Islands and areas that are hard to get to otherwise. And, and this area also really touches on how we bridge over to some of the other strategies, because now we can go out and we can collect a lot of these images, a lot more than we might not have been able to otherwise, but how do we count these? And so there's a huge overlap with the artificial intelligence strategy that you just heard about. And so this, the scientist here is working with both the UAS and then the AI techniques to actually automate the counting of those, of those creatures. The down here in the bottom left, this is a picture of a, of a small UAS flying over a whale as it, uh, as it breaches. And so they're actually collecting the, the, the emissions from the whale to determine its health. You know, this is ship-based operations. They actually land the, the UAS in the water and pick it up. And then over on the right is collecting marine debris. So broad range there. So our strategy, what, what is specifically in there? The five goals, is, as you've heard, all of them have. The first is to you know, coordinate and support operations. So really build a greater capability to operate these across all of the, all of the, the NOAA missions. The second is to expand the application. So that, that's really one of the primary goals is make sure that we're using these more and across the full range of our activities. The third is to accelerate the transition of early stage research into actual operations. And that's always one of the really challenging things to do in NOAA is go from an idea to actual use. Uh, fourth is expand partnerships with universities, with commercial industry and the like. And then finally, and perhaps most important here is to really promote this proficiency in the workforce, to bring people into this, to get education and, and get more people involved in it. So, Who's working with, with UXS and NOAA? And so if you wanted to work in this area, who do you go out to? And this slide, it's a, it's a busy slide because it really looks a lot like the, the full structure of NOAA as a whole. And, and that's really where we want it to be. But these activities are spread over a lot of our different mission activities. In the Office of Marine and Aviation and Operations, this is, this is actually the pilots, the planners, the people actually operating them. So we go into fisheries. Those are going out and looking at the seals, the sea lions, and, and that's really where a lot of our work has really been. Uh, in the ocean surface, mapping coastlines, going out in the marine sanctuaries, looking at for uh, illegal fishing. Across our research area and our, uh, across a broad area of the research uh, that we have going on, and I, I really don't have time to go into that in detail. In the weather service, you know, after tornadoes, after hurricanes, doing a lot of work there. I don't have it on here, but in the satellite service, uh, validating satellite measurements. And so if you're interested in working with UXS, follow your science, follow your interests, and there'll be appropriate people out there that you can talk to. Uh, you know, I had the, the, the great fortune of working with a couple of students just directly myself in this area. You know, one was through a, a NOAA NERTO process, Carlos Juan Gonzalez from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, who was involved in developing a sensor related to salinity. And then also a hauling scholar from the University of Oklahoma, Rachel Norris, looking at, at hurricane data. And so I found those opportunities to be really quite rewarding. So. Uh, you know, again, if there are any questions that we can't get to, my email there is uh, gary.a.wick at noaa.gov. And so I, I, I really hope some of you are able to follow down this path. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wick. That was fantastic. Next, we'll have Dr. Jeanette Davis. Hello, everyone. Just sharing my screen here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. I can't see you, so 
Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, good afternoon. Thank you uh, to um, Dr. Larry Robertson and EPP for um, inviting me to be a part of the discussion today. I'm not going to be before you long, but I just wanted to, you know, um, say thank you. It's really an honor to be here as an uh, EPP graduate. Um, FAMU is like a second home to me. I have so many mentors there. Um, so thank you. Um, but as I get started on uh, my background, I will start off by saying there is nothing like the standard of excellence in my home by the sea, Hampton University. Um, I always say that it is by far in the top five best decisions that I've ever made in my life was attending Hampton University. Um, growing up, I loved science as a child, but did not have the language of science to say that I wanted to be a scientist. Um, but I just kind of followed that journey of just loving science, always doing well in, throughout school in science. And by the time I got to Hampton University, I thought to myself, well, I, I love science and chemistry was my favorite. So I thought I'll major in chemistry and then go on to be a medical doctor because that's clearly the path that you take when you love science. But lo and behold, Hampton University had an amazing marine science department. And I, you know, I'm not one who grew up on the beaches thinking, you know, I want to study the ocean. It literally was being on Hampton University's campus and having that opportunity available to me where I went into the department and I learned that to study marine and environmental science um, is to study a combination of sciences. So I got a chance to do all the chemistries that I love. I was exposed to then meteorology, geology, of course, marine science, and so many different types of sciences. And that's where I really found my place in love for marine science. Um, I did internships every summer while I was there, which eventually led to an internship where I met my PhD advisor, um, Dr. Russell Hill at University of Maryland, and I was able to combine, combine my passion for the ocean with natural products discovery. So I essentially got my PhD um, in marine microbiology, focusing on um, finding new medicines from the ocean. Um, um, and then on the bottom uh, there, I have a picture that is uh, actually in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I Before the pandemic, I used to go to uh, uh, Trinidad and Tobago for Carnival. And that picture there is just a reminder to be present, um, to always appreciate and value the most valuable uh, resource that we have on our planet, which is the ocean, but also work hard and have fun. Um, the middle picture is a picture of me in the Senate Commerce Chambers. I started my career after grad school at NOAA through the Canals Fellowship, which I'll talk about a little more um, in my presentation. But as a Canals Fellow, you essentially can work on the legislative side or the executive side, but either way you have um, so much opportunity to expose yourself to new things. And as fellows, we got an opportunity to uh, mark up a, a bill and to go from the, the House to the Senate and do all the things as if we were in um, Congress. And it was a really great opportunity to figure out how law is made. And I got a chance to sit in the same seats as uh, President Obama and really understand uh, how Congress works and how that is applied to the science overall. Um, and then the, in the top right, I have a picture of my family. Um, and believe it or not, although that's a lot of us, just a really small portion of my family, I was uh, really blessed and fortunate to come from a really big uh, supportive family. I have um, now 11 nephews and three nieces, which was the motivation behind my children's science book. And it's just a reminder that um, my family is my rock and I'm so grateful to have them. And then the last picture on the bottom right um, is me doing some outreach in the school um, I am a huge advocate of diversity in the sciences. Um, I go by the science. I mean, the, the term science is everywhere and science is for everyone. And my job is to really connect everyone with science and let them know that they can be included in conversations no matter what they look like or no matter where they come from. So with that being said, um, as mentioned, I am a marine microbiologist by training. And modern day microbiologists don't go around carrying microscope to study the things that we can't see uh, with the naked eye. We instead study things at the molecular level. And omics essentially is this broad un umbrella term 
that we use at NOAA to mean the study of things at the molecular level, right? So um, we are using these methods um, in looking at things like DNA, RNA, proteins, or metabolites. So again, it's a it's an umbrella term that we use. Um, and we are implementing these tools because they are faster, they are cheaper, um, less invasive. They're essentially able to go um, where not all people can go, but we can kind of collect the water sample without being too invasive on the environment. So it's a really great tool for that. Um, these tools tend to be more robust. And overall, because of that, it, it allows us to improve the delivery of our overall products and services. Um, so the goal is that we really are using this technology and we're integrating it all over NOAA um, and, and transforming the way that we approach biological investigation. We've talked a bit about NOAA's organizational structure. Um, here's just a picture. You know, we say that we're science, service, and stewardship because we are the um, atmospheric and oceanic um, administration, I like to say that our jurisdiction is essentially the planet. Um, and so we do everything from deep sea exploration to satellites um, and imaging. Um, and on the bottom there are what we call our line offices or particular departments at NOAA. And I'm just highlighting here um, all of the departments where we are utilizing omics technologies. And we're using that in a variety of applications. So here I'm just highlighting some of the ways that we're using this throughout NOAA. And that's from in everything from enhancing aquaculture of marine species. Um, we are using environmental DNA in so many ways, including um, trying to gauge it for stock assessments, um, for community diversity, invasive species. We use it to monitor health and conditions of various types of marine organisms. Um, it's also a way that we can characterize organisms, but also their response to environmental stress, stressors and change, including climate change. Um, we also use it for population structure and diversity interbreeding, um, and overall sustainable fisheries. And we're using it again as a proxy to engage how healthy an environment is and how organisms may respond to environmental conditions. So it, it's, we're using overall to um, ensure healthy communities and ecosystems. I'm going to uh, tell a little bit about some of the science I've been able to be a part of. Um, in 2019, we did this joint US and Canadian survey where we looked at um, Pacific hake. And the goal here was to investigate the feasibility of using eDNA to detect and support abundance assessments of Pacific hake. Now we've been doing this study for a very long time. Every other year we go out and we do a Pacific hake survey because it is a very important fisheries um, and it's about um, $50 million or so um, in value. And that was as of 2018. So again, the aims of this study was to try to in integrate eDNA um, along the West Coast, um, potentially use that information to develop indices of abundance for Hake eDNA. And we also wanted to archive some of the samples to support future analysis of other species. So that's one great thing about using eDNA or some of these molecular tools. It actually gives you a, the ability to capture what is there and at, um, to capture what is going on. And then you can always go back to those samples. So here I'm just showing um, some of the collection, collecting the water via CTD, uh, sampling and, and filtering that water to capture the eDNA. We then put it in the license buffer. But I also want to take the time to highlight this was um, this is one of the projects where uh, various parts of our um, s and strategies were used and combined. So we use cell drones. So we just um, heard um, about um, un uncrewed system. So this was an opportunity where we integrated a cell drone, which is an uncrewed systems with omics, with its eDNA. And then we also use acoustics trawl survey, um, which requires a lot of cloud computing and data. So this was a really unprecedented study where we took all of these modern day technologies to really get at um, how best to sample and how best to do stock assessments and are these tools complementary? Is one tool better than the other? Um, and so 
I recently got some preliminary data and I'm really excited because I just got this slide today. Um, but essentially we sampled the entire West Coast and what, it, what this is showing in red is the um, copy number of DNA. And we, we uh, looked at DNA throughout various depths. So at the top, you see zero to 500, which indicates the depth. Um, and then the last one, the last picture in blue are, is the acoustics. So you can see how some of these red dots, which indicates how much the, the, the copy number of eDNA that we found in those samples in comparison to the acoustics that we found in blue. And so we're at this point, just preliminarily able to see that we're able to pick up on eDNA samples at specific depths. So going back, we may wanna say, well, hey, this is the optimal depth that we're able to really capture that DNA. And this, does that cu couple also with the acoustics? And the goal is also to um, look at this with some of the, um, sam the trawl sampling that we did as well. And so again, do these techniques complement each other? Is one um, best over the other? And can we use this as a proxy to determine how many fish ultimately are in the sea? Dr. Davis, can we please wrap, wrap it up? Because uh, we only have one minute and we still need to get to Dr. Da Dr. Gonzalez's talk. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, so I think this is my second to last slide actually, but we already talked about the goals um, highlighted in all of the strategies. Goal five for us is also to promote workforce proficiency in omics. And I'll also add that all of the strategies have consistent language around diversity and inclusion in building um, in this workforce. So uh, that's important for students. And I would like to just lastly say that if you happen to want to come to NOAA and um, contribute to omics or any of the st strategies that were discussed. I know specifically for omics, if you Google, there's not gonna be an omics position necessarily. Um, it's a way, it's a tool that we're using to integrate across line offices, but I just wanna leave you with um, student opportunities that are available. And so maybe these student opportunities don't say omics necessarily, but it's a great way of getting involved in the research at NOAA. So I would encourage you to um, look for student opportunities, and then from there, find a mentor or a scientist who is doing the research that you're interested in. And these are some graduate internship programs. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Dr. Davis. That was absolutely fantastic. Let's go ahead and shift over to Dr. Gonzalez. And I'll, hey, I'll good afternoon. I, I, Craig, Craig is going to come up right after you. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez, but I, I I think I'll be able to take at least five minutes of his time. Okay. okay. So and you I'll got about seven actually, minutes. Yeah, I'll try to actually be kind of quick here uh, and adjust as well. So good afternoon. Great to see everybody. EPP Forum is always a family reunion. Uh, so glad to, even though we can't be there in person, glad to be here virtually with you here. And I'm, I'm going to truncate my 15120 just to highlight two things. Uh, number one, you see that top picture. Uh, that's my good childhood friend, CJ. He's, a, he's, he's my brother, essentially. Uh, we have always pushed each other. We've always uh, been having a friendly competition uh, to help drive each other, both professionally and in, personal, in our personal lives. And I just I highlight that picture because I think about my colleagues on the panel today, Janice, uh, you know, Jeanette today, all the EPP alumni that are, uh, that are on, online here today, it has been very valuable having you all here and us all pushing for each other, helping to support each other in our growth. And so my message to the students is, you know, while you are in graduate school, undergrad, you know, be thinking about these, the, the building this EPP family and really holding on to the contacts you're making with your fellow students and your, and your alumni there, because we really will bring a lot of value to you both, uh, you know, professionally over the long term and personally, um, uh, hopefully. Uh, speaking of friends and family there, I'd also just want to give a shout out to at, soon to be at Dr. Ashley Lacey down there at uh, CCMA down there at FAMU. It was crazy to me. I got a pretty big family. I'm from North Carolina, but uh, my dad's side of the family is pretty huge down in Florida there. So Ashley, I ran into her uh, before I knew she was at CCMA at a, uh, at a uh, STEM meeting 
uh, in Baltimore. We were like, oh, wow. So it was pretty cool how small the uh, world is. And, and, and again, we're all pushing for each other, whether we're family by blood or, or, or joined to the hip as an EPP family there. Uh, I'll go ahead and drop to the next slide, please. Uh, and so the purpose of my uh, talk here is to really give some examples of how the science and technology focal areas are driving a specific area of NOAA science that I work in and serve as the portfolio manager. That's in the area of eco forecasting. Uh, just as you have a weather forecast, you probably looked at the weather, you say, hey, I know it's cloudy here today, uh, it's gonna rain, let me grab my umbrella. You got that information, that forecast, and you took an action. Eco forecasting, we're doing the same thing. Uh, just in our case, we are forecasting phenomena that bring that help predict the ecology of the system and brings it to account living things. But it's the same, same way we do the weather. We take observations, we develop a suite of predictive models, and then we deliver a forecast that people can take action on. And so for us in eco forecasting, our portfolio is largely around harmful algal blooms. Uh, our friends and family down in the Gulf Coast, uh, uh, down in Texas and Florida, quite familiar with red tide. Um, uh, uh, we deal with halves, harmful algal blooms all across the U.S. Uh, we deal with hypoxia and forecasting hypoxia water. Uh, we also do a lot of work in climate resilience around changes in fish habitat based on changing climate scenarios uh, and a lot of work in aquatic pathogens, mostly with Vibrio. Uh, essentially, my point here is that we are developing forecast models for living things that allow us to then make decisions that promote the blue economy, shellfish aquaculture, for example, uh, recreation and tourism. We, in Florida, our forecasts help uh, keep people off the beach when there's a bad red tide uh, and those toxins that come from that red tide can uh, potentially cause respiratory illness. Well, NOAA delivers a forecast that helps protect people and prevent them from going to the hospital. Uh, in each of those areas, uses, each of these forecast areas uses heavily the science and technology focal areas. So for example, uh, in harmful algal blooms, unmanned systems plays a huge role in getting get, gathering observations and hab counts, uh, the use of gliders, the use of environmental sampling processors, the use of imaging flow cytobots. There's a ton of technology that goes into those efforts. And I think about, you know, when we think about the CSCs and all the work, good, great work that comes out of Crest, for example, and the engineering backgrounds, that is where you see the application of that engineering and technology around the use of unmanned systems pretty heavily. And especially much of this work is guided by our folks uh, in NCOS, which is my office uh, within the o National Ocean Service, as well as the integrated ocean observing system uh, as well, is doing a lot of those unmanned systems and gathering that data. Omics plays a big piece. Uh, you heard uh, Jeanette mention um, you know, the technology around omics. Well, we go out and, and actually sample and use uh, genetic uh, markers to detect things like pathogens in oysters and pathogens in the water and be able to predict um, the abundance of those or forecast the abundance of those uh, there. I can keep going, but my major point right here is that within each of these science and technology focal areas, this area of eco forecasting provides specific examples of their use and what is a large across NOAA portfolio. Um, I wanna encourage students, faculty, let's be engaged because the, tech, the technical expertise across the board in each of the CSCs can play a major role in driving this uh, portfolio there. Uh, and I also, we talk about the science and technology focal areas. I also just wanna highlight that social science plays a major role in this effort as well. Uh, so our social scientists out there, we need to be able to understand and engage with the public to understand their needs. We also need to be able to build in your expertise so that we're not just forecasting for the ecology of the system, but we're also connecting that ecology back to socioeconomics and to people and communities as well. Uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time for additional information and insight. Uh, we need you as partners. We need your minds. We need your capabilities there. And I'm glad to pick up on this conversation further down the line. Thank you. I'll stop there. Fantastic, Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you so much for that presentation. We're about four minutes over into your break. I hate to take your break, but you 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 honestly heard um, really a lot about different areas 
of science and technology that we're advancing here uh, within NOAA, with our partners. The partnership is extremely important uh, and valuable. Uh, so look at the, the integrated nature of the science that we're doing and ask yourself a question. How does this particular strategy fit within the goals and objectives of my science? And so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. White. And I just want to say thank you again. This panel was fantastic. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, this was a, a wonderful, wonderful session. I hope you all got a lot out of it. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll be here to respond to your questions in the chat.